I want to kind of continue talking about this idea of, of purpose. Uh, now, last week we, we talked about kind of personal purpose, kind of in the new year, you know, we all kind of tend to do that kind of self-evaluation, you know, even if you're not into New Year's resolutions, which I'm not really into, but it is kind of, you know, it's good to have times in our lives to kind of just evaluate where we are and, and kind of find out or figure out where we want to be. But this week, I want to look at purpose on a different level. This week, I want to talk about purpose um, as a church. And, and, you know, how do we go about achieving that purpose? Because in reality, every organization, whether it's a company, whether it's a club, whether it's a church, has a purpose. Now, oftentimes, if you think about things like, like clubs and social environments, the purpose is often just kind of a side effect, that people come together, kind of everybody pursues what they want to pursue, and a side effect of that is something comes out of it, and that becomes kind of the default purpose of the organization. But successful organizations actually have intentional purpose. Successful organizations choose their purpose, and then once they choose the purpose, as opposed to the purpose becoming a side effect of actions, the purpose determines the actions. The purpose, the stated purpose, helps us decide what to do and what not to do. So that kind of leads us to an important question, that what's our purpose? And so in this series that we're kicking off today, what I'd like to talk about is being purpose-built, that recognizing that we exist for a purpose. And so again, the question is, what is our purpose? And another way of asking that question is, why does the United Church of Warner exist? And I think you can state it like this. We exist to inspire people to pursue and find life in Jesus. That is our fundamental purpose. Now, that's kind of a brief phrasing, but it actually is driven very much by Matthew chapter 28. Because in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus is wrapping up his earthly ministry, his followers have seen the crucifixion, they have seen his resurrection, they have seen him alive, leading them. When he wraps up, he makes it clear that their purpose is not just to gather together, although that's really important. He makes it clear that the purpose is much bigger than that. He makes it clear that the purpose is to take those things that Jesus has taught them and teach them to other people. And to take the lifestyle that they've seen Jesus live and he's taught them to live and show other people how to live that way. And he says, tell people the commands that I have given you. And we know that he kind of gives kind of two commands, but they pretty much overlap. Right? One command initially is love God and love others, but then he zeroes in more on the love others. He says, love others as I have loved you. And then he makes very clear that although that they would see him ascend into heaven, and they wouldn't see him physically with them anymore, he makes it abundantly clear that I am always with you. So the charge that he gave to the church, and we are part of that church, 2,000 years later, we are part of that church. The charge he gave to the church is, Show people what you've seen and what you've learned. Share that with people. And that will draw people to Jesus. And so that's why our purpose is to inspire people to pursue and find life in Jesus. That's why we exist. So if that's why we exist, that means that purpose needs to drive the decisions that we make. And so as we look into the new year and as we kind of plan ahead and as we get into the annual meeting next month and we talk about the sort of things that we want to do, the things that we do, the things we choose to do, need to be things that are consistent with that purpose. So that means as we step back and we look at our church, we're going to look around and we're going to see a lot of great things that we're doing. And we're going to make sure we keep doing those things. But there may be some things we look at and we say, wow, you know, that's not really consistent with our purpose. And there might be new things that we have to do or we choose to do because they are consistent with our purpose. 
Now, one of the things to always keep in mind is that we talk about church like it's a single entity, like it's just kind of this kind of, you know, body itself. But it is a body, but what's the body made up of? It's you, right? The, the church is people. You know, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's me. And the key thing to remember is that in the true church, we're all peers, right? We all work together and we all support one another. And we all have a say in how things go. So if the church is made up of a group of individuals, how does this group of individuals with our own thoughts and our own ideas, how do we successfully achieve a common purpose? And as, so, as is so often the case, that answer or the answer to that question can be found in one of the letters that Paul writes. Because remember that one of the main things that Paul was consistently doing, the Apostle Paul was consistently guiding the early church. And so, so many of these letters that he wrote were to help the church kind of know how to do things. Now, the thing that's interesting is that if you look at many of his letters, he's usually addressing a problem, that there's some issue that's arisen in a church, or sometimes a lot of issues that have arisen in a particular church, and he's writing letters to try to help people work through those and try to bring the church back on track. But one of his letters, a letter to a church in Philippi, what we know as the book of Philippians, was actually a letter written to encourage a church because this church is doing so much good. So as he writes to the Philippians, what he's pointing out is that, man, you guys are really getting it done. You're supporting uh, other ministries. You're caring for people. You're doing all these good things. And that's his primary focus in that letter. But he does point out one thing that concerns him. He's heard that there are disagreements starting to happen inside the church. And that there are kind of two sections that are kind of trying to drive things, maybe in their own way a little bit, or are at least having trouble agreeing on what they should do. And so in this letter that's filled with encouragement, as part of the encouragement, he basically gives them some guidance for addressing these disagreements that are arising. Excuse me, arising. So Paul says, Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. So as he's pointing out here is that to function effectively, they need to function in agreement. In fact, I think we'd even go on to say that they have a history of functioning in agreement. But there's this division that's beginning to kind of poke, poke through. It's not really got a strong hold yet, but it's starting to poke through. And so what he wants them to understand is that their individualism is still really important. That every person's gifts are really important. And the ideas and attitudes of every person are important. But he wants them to understand that the important thing is to take those gifts and take those ideas and unify around that one purpose. And he makes it really clear that unity, true unity, is built on love. Working together toward our common purpose. But then he goes one step further. And he says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And that's the key thing about a church versus most other organizations. Most organizations are driven by self-interest. But the church is driven by others' interests, interest in others. Because if as a church, if we all start demanding that I want my thing and my thing has to happen this way and my thing has to happen at this time and if it's not the way I want it, I'm not going to participate. If a church starts doing that, doing that, it's never going to achieve its overall purpose. Because as a church, our personal interests can start to drown out our greater purpose. And so Paul is just saying that it's important to come together in love, recognizing that although every individual is important, our purpose is about serving others. And the thing is that, and I think we all know this, is that having nothing to do with church, if you look back at times in your life where you were part of something that was bigger than yourself, 
It may have been a job or a company that you, that you actually believed in what they did. It may have been a club that you were a part of. It may have been a volunteering effort. There's virtually nothing that we do alone that is as fulfilling as being part of something bigger than ourselves, pursuing something bigger than ourselves, and taking our individual gifts, combining them with the gifts of other people, and then achieving something through that. That provides a level of fulfillment that working alone can rarely even come close to. So what we need to do then as a church, as we seek our personal fulfillment, is to recognize that that fulfillment can be found by pursuing our common purpose. Again, this purpose to inspire others to pursue and find life in Jesus. So as we go into the new year, we'll start to make some adjustments around this idea of making sure that we are on purpose, that we are actually following our purpose. So the question then is that kind of where do we begin with that? Where is the place to begin to start to kind of really organize increasingly effectively around our purpose? And I think a big part of that is community. Now, we've talked about community before, but it's important to remember, excuse me, remember that community kind of can have two general meanings, right? One version of community is our local community, you know, Warner and the surrounding region. And we've actually talked about that just a few months ago. Right? We had that series, Community Matters, where we actually talked about this idea of serving our community. And serving our community, excuse me, community is important. And I think one of the things we'll look at as we go forward is looking at how we can increasingly serve our community. But there's another aspect of community that's also really, really important. And that's our church community. Because as our church community, one of the things we have to recognize is that, and we all know this, the world has changed. Over the past several decades, the world has changed tremendously. Over the past 10 years alone, the world has shifted at incredible speed. And then you throw a pandemic in, and life changes further still. So if we're going to remain effective, if we're going to achieve the purpose that Jesus himself gave to us, then we need to adjust based on those realities. So throughout this series, we'll be looking at kind of being purpose-built and how that impacts our community within the church. And today, what I'd like to really focus on is that this idea of being purpose built, I think one of the key things we need to think about is bringing new life. How do we bring new life into the church? Because in a healthy church, new life is a sort of thing that, that we need to consistently bring in. But there's a challenge that goes with that. And what I'm about to say has, is not a church-specific thing, it's just a thing thing, is that in any long-standing community of any sort, that community begins to become inward-focused. It's, it's rarely intentional, but what happens? You get a group of people together, and we're all hanging out together, and we all say, hey, what do you want to do? Well, what do you want to do? And we start to choose the things that we like. And as we choose the things that we like, we start to become a group that all like the same things. Now, that's good. It's good that we all like the same things. But what happens when you try to attract people from outside the group? The group has specialized on its own interests. No one ever intends to do it, but it's just what happens. And so what that means then is that attracting people from outside the group gets harder and harder. And that's the exact opposite of what we're supposed to do as a church. Because we're going to have a hard time inspiring people to pursue and find life in Jesus. Oops, wrong slide. Pursue and find life in Jesus if there aren't any new people coming around. Because as a, as a church, we are called to do two sets of things, generally speaking. Care for those who are here, and that's part of kind of pursuing and finding life in Jesus, that none of us are in this perfect relationship with Jesus, right? We're all on a, a path of getting closer and closer and closer. 
And that's part of our responsibility, but also part of responsibility is to help people onto the path, making it critical that we also reach new people. And so as we look at this idea of connecting with people who aren't here yet, there's this really kind of uh, powerful kind of symbiotic relationship that starts to happen with growth. Is that as a church community starts to grow, one of the things that starts to happen is it starts to diversify. Because a healthy church contains a wide variety of people. Right? People with, with different backgrounds and different viewpoints. And what I'm about to say may upset some. It should have Republicans and Democrats in the same congregation. You know, people on the left and people on the right should be in the same congregation. And we should all be together. And we should be in very different phases of our faith journeys. Right? Some of us are long-standing and, and really solid in our faith. Other folks are still trying to figure out their faith. They're not quite sure all the things they believe. And there's also be people who aren't even sure they want a faith journey. People who just feel like something's missing from their lives. And then that creates this continuum of people along the faith journey. And they start to care for each other. And they all start to grow as they come together. And also it's important to have people spread across the whole spectrum of life stages. More mature people, younger people, single people, families. We, we need to put all of our energy, all of our energy, into creating that kind of community. Because what ends up happening is that as a diverse community comes together unified around a single central purpose, we all get better. Because if we bring in younger people and people who are newer in their faith journeys, they're going to bring energy. Right? There's just an energy that comes with that. And also, if we give them a, what's called a seat at the table, input in the kind of decisions that we make, they're going to have new ideas, ideas that we're not going to have. I mean, we're all, what, over, other than Gabe, we're all over 50, right? right? Basically, if we're all over 50, we don't have a lot of new ideas left. We've used most of ours up. Right? But, but people, I mean, think about how you were in your 20s and 30s, how you would hang it out there, how you would do things that you would never consider doing now. I'm just happy to be in bed before 930 now, you know? You know, it's like, it was different. And so as you bring those in, they, they, start to, they start to stretch us, and they'll encourage us to push our boundaries. They're going to have ideas we're never going to have. But at the same time, those who are more mature bring a wisdom, an experience going, hey, I know that sounds like a good idea, but I went down that path. I know what that looks like. And we start to care for each other. And the more mature community brings sensibilities and provides stability. And in a high-functioning environment, you function in tension, right? Tension of pushing boundaries but maintaining sensibilities. Tension of new ideas but going, I know that seems new to you, but... I thought it was new to me 30 years ago, and there was a guy 30 years older than me who thought it was new too, and we've been down here, and we work those things out together. And when we do that, then we can start to do things together that we can never do without that. So as we go through this series, and as we talk about this idea of, of our church community and creating a healthy church community, what I'd like to do is walk through a, a narrative from the Old Testament. It's actually what's called the Book of Ruth. It's a very short book. It's about four chapters. And what we'll do is that we'll just kind of begin it today, just kind of the very beginning of it today. But then we'll walk through it over the next few weeks. Because I think what we can see is that the Book of Ruth can show us a lot about community. Because although that book is named for just one person, Ruth, it's actually about three very different people who come together and what comes from that. And what it shows us is that what can start to happen when people from very different backgrounds walk through life together. And that's what church is meant to be. A variety of backgrounds walking through life together. Now, the book of Ruth takes place about a thousand years before Jesus, so about 3,000 years ago. And it actually occurs during a period of great disorder. I mean, kind of like what we live in now. Now, in our case, disorder is kind of our, 
you know, our economic system and political systems and religious systems are all kind of mixed up. In their case, it was a little bit more harsh than that. Uh, but it's the same, same idea as that there's this group of people in a nation known as Judah. Now, Judah is the ancestor to what we know now as Israel. And these people had kind of expected life to go a specific way, but then things started to change. Now, the people who became the nation of Judah are the ancient Hebrews, the people who followed Moses and so forth. And the thing is that when, that when those people first came together, they had very, very strong leaders. They had Moses, which we get to watch every Easter right on ABC. Right? Um, but then also they had Joshua. right? So Moses, a powerful, uh, really closely connected to God leader. Joshua, a great warrior. They were their first two leaders. But then later they moved to what is known as the period of the judges. Now, in these terms, a judge is not someone who sits behind a bench and kind of makes decisions. In this context, a judge is an overseer. So basically, he's a protector. He provides some counsel. He or she provides some counsel because there are female judges as well. They provide counsel to people and they oversee things, but they don't tell people what to do. They're not a leader that way. And in fact, if you read the book of Judges, it basically says that everyone simply did what was right in their own mind. Everybody just did what they wanted. And so they, they had gone from having clear leadership to everyone just trying to figure it out on their own. And then there was another layer of complexity. Judah had its own set of disorder because of a lack of leadership. But then also the world as they knew it was also changing. Because in that area of the world, for a long time, the Egyptians had been a superpower. The Mesopotamians had been a superpower. And these were all on decline. So not only did they have disorder in their own house, but the world that they knew was just shifting all around them. And people weren't really sure what to do. And, and that's the period that Ruth takes place in. Because all the established norms that they expected were gone. So when the narrative starts, the first person we meet is a woman named Naomi. Now, Naomi is married and she has two sons. And, when, and she lives in a place that might sound familiar. She lives in a place called Bethlehem. But now this is Bethlehem, the same Bethlehem that Jesus would be born in a thousand years later. That's where she starts. And what's happened is there's a famine. And there could be any number of reasons for a famine. It could have been weather. The more likely situation is all the turmoil is just making the prospect of raising food very difficult. And so what Naomi and her husband decide to do is move. And so they go on an 800-mile journey to another country named Moab. So Naomi, her husband, and her two sons take the chance, bring in changes, and move far away. And as they get to the new home, something very unexpected happens. Naomi's husband dies. Now, remember that this is a deeply patriarchal society. It is not a society where a woman could really support herself. You kind of had to be a man to even kind of find work sort of thing. So, of course, that creates challenges. But the one kind of saving thing that Naomi had is that her children were sons. So they could at least work for the family and care for the family. So although certainly not ideal, they're doing mostly okay. And over the years, Naomi's sons marry two, girl, two local girls, two Moabite girls. One of those girls is named Ruth. And now life seems like it's kind of going okay, that they've kind of got their new family built. Her sons are adults. They're creating their own families. But about 10 years go by, and both her sons die. And so now, the journey that started with her husband and her two sons, they're not here anymore. The narrative goes on to say, this left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. But does she not have anybody? She does have somebody. She has two daughters. They're daughters-in-law. But in that culture, when a woman married into a family, that's her family now. But I think the reason the narrative is written this way that Naomi is all alone is because that's how Naomi felt that her sons and her husband were gone, which is, of course, devastating. 
But I think it also shows that her life is not like she expected. And because her life is not like she expected, she can only see what she's lost. She's not able to see what she still has. But then after this happens, she gets some good news. It goes on to say, Then Naomi heard that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. So now we see there's a sense of excitement. She's like, hey, you know, think where we used to be. Things are better now. So let's go back there. But I think Naomi may be falling into a trap that any of us can fall into. That as our life goes on and our life doesn't look the way we wish it did. We can start wishing we could go back to a time in the past. But of course, going back to where she was in the past is not going to make things like it used to be. Because first of all, a lot of years have gone by. Things have changed. So times have changed. But also, even though the place she came from may have been a good place. I'll assume that Bethlehem is an okay place. Going back to Bethlehem is not going to make it was like it was in the past because although the place was nice, what made it really special for her in the past? The people. And those people aren't there anymore. So trying to go back there to that place is not going to reconnect her with her husband and her sons. Going back to try to recreate the past is just going to be disappointing. And it seems that during the journey, Naomi comes to realize that. Because this excitement to return back to her homeland seems to become, I would say, almost depression. as she begins to drop down because although she took her two daughters-in-law and they start traveling during the journey, she kind of turns to them and says, This is a waste of time. Things are hopeless. Don't come back with me. There's no hope there. In fact, she goes on to say, this is Naomi, things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. It seems that she realized that going back there was not going to bring back the past. But then she went one step further. And since it couldn't be just like the past, suddenly it's no good at all. Now, the daughters-in-law initially resist. They say, no, we're in this with you, we're in this with you. Naomi continues to insist. One of the daughters-in-law finally relents and says, you know what, I will go back to my family. And I think that was a completely reasonable choice. I don't think we should look down on her at all for that. This would have been a hard life. But it also seems that Ruth sees something differently. Because as Naomi pushes and pushes for the the young ladies to leave, and the one does leave, Ruth refuses to leave, and she says this, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Ruth sees something that Naomi doesn't see. Once Naomi realized that it couldn't be just like the past, Naomi decided that it's all bad now. But what Ruth saw was that, wait a minute, we're family now. Yes, the family doesn't look just like it did before, but we're still a family. And you know, the things that you had in the past were good, and of course, celebrate those things. But trying to return to the past isn't going to bring them back. But there are still really good things because we're together now. We're a family now. We can do new things together now. So as we create something new, you know what? It is going to be different from the past. But it's still beautiful. And here's the key. It's ours and it's ours today. So let's not be so focused on the past that we miss the gifts of 
today. And as we kind of close out today, I think that's the message that, that I'd ask us all to internalize. That whether it's in our individual lives or as a church, things are always going to change. And we don't want to make the mistake of always trying to recreate the past. One, it's probably not going to work. And it's going to be disappointing. But we can embrace the present that we're in, the place that we are in and the time that we are in. And as we make an effort to connect with new people, again, whether it's our lives or it's our church, that's when we come together in a new way and create a new future that may be very different from the past, but that doesn't make it bad. It just makes it different. And as we kind of look into this upcoming year, and as we reorient around our purpose, around our mission, we're going to have to make decisions like that. There is no intent to ever obliterate the past. We are here because of all the things from the past. But as we go forward, as we build our future, our future is built on bringing forward the good things that we still have, but also embracing new things, embracing new people, trying new things, trying things that aren't going to work sometimes. But we build our future that way. Because I am convinced, I am convinced that God is opening new doors for us. And as we go through those doors, our future is built on all that we bring with us and all the things that are appropriate to carry forward and on the new things that we'll find. So as we wrap up, we've just started into the book of Ruth. We will spend more time in the book of Ruth in the weeks ahead. But the one key message I would ask us all to take from this, our past may have been great, but there's no going back to it. We have to make the choice to go forward. And I don't think that's a trade-off. I think there's a tremendous future in front of us, but we have to be willing to orient what we do around our purpose. Our purpose is to inspire people to pursue and find life in Jesus. That's why we exist. And so we need to pursue that passionately, and we need to do what it takes to achieve that today. And, and I am absolutely convinced that as we do that, although there will undoubtedly be points of discomfort along the way, that our individual fulfillment will rise, and our corporate, our church-wide fulfillment will rise if we are willing to step fully in to the reality that we're in and focus on pursuing the purpose we got directly from Jesus on what we're called to do.